So as you can see, um, my project is entitled Classical Illusion in James Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, and I wanted to start off by talking about the digital humanities because my project um, actually started as writing a traditional thesis paper and then moved into making a website. So in the spirit of digital humanities, I had a Ryan Gosling meme because you know they're all over the internet now. Uh, and I just thought it's useful to define the field because it's a fairly new area of study. Um, and this definition did a really good job. It describes the digital humanities as a field of study, but also research, teaching, and invention. Um, and it's very methodological, so it focuses on practical things rather than theory, um, and very interdisciplinary in scope. And it involves not just putting things that already exist online, but also analysis, synthesis, um, and investigation. And what I thought was really cool about this definition is I found it in a book but the book cited Wikipedia for the definition, which might seem a little kind of unlegitimate, but um, actually I think I looked up the um, contributors to the page and it was a lot of really famous people in the field of digital humanities. So I think it's kind of cool that I, I could find a very legitimate definition online. It kind of speaks to the project as a whole, I think. So the goals of digital humanities projects um, are many and varied, but they generally want to encourage new study in fields that are seen as kind of technologically stagnant. Um, and as a classics major, I know all about that. Um, they also serve to make texts more accessible to a wider audience. For example, if someone wrote a paper about um, you know, maybe some vases that they dug up in Egypt, it's not going to be a bestseller. So there might only be you know, 20 or 50 copies of the essay published. And it's a real issue if you can't get one from your local library. Um, you know, if you can't find it, like how are you going to know about this research? So it's really important to put things like this online to really encourage a kind of worldwide dialogue. It also um, can let you analyze works in new ways. I don't know if you all heard about The Cuckoo's Calling, which was written recently under a pseudonym. Um, it was actually revealed that J.K. Rowling was the author of this book through use of stylometry. So basically, they ran the work through a computer program, and in about 30 minutes, it, um, about as definitively as you could, prove that she was the author. So that was a really neat application of kind of new ways to explore text by putting them online. And you can also have new kinds of scholarship. It can be really interactive. You can have footnotes that have pictures and videos. Um, you can really get people to start a dialogue which is something that doesn't necessarily happen when you just publish an essay you know, in a journal. Um, so my project in particular uh, was the creation of a website called Antiquity in Ireland that is a collaborative database of classical illusions in Irish literature. Um, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to break it down into three parts. The first was putting digital text online. So we picked works by Irish authors, put them online, and then annotated them. So we essentially created endnotes or footnotes, but instead of doing it in the traditional sense, we have to flip all the way to the back, we did them in little digital pop-up windows. So if you're reading the book online, there'll be a bolded word, and you'll hover your mouse over it, and then a pop-up window will come up and explain, oh, Odysseus was the king of Ithaca, he fought in the Trojan War, blah, blah, blah. So basically, it's like a footnote, but it's a lot more accessible, um, and it's online. Uh, and so we didn't want to just have these little snippets of you know, short definitions of words that we picked out of a text. We also wanted to treat things holistically. So we also included some short essays to kind of give you a broader thematic context. So you know, instead of just hearing, oh, this is a, who Odysseus is, you can look at the essay and see, oh, here are all these other writers who mention Odysseus, or here's how this theme continues throughout this book, just to kind of put it all in perspective. Uh, and then the third portion is forums for user discussion, because we didn't want, you know, I've been working on it with myself and another undergraduate, and we thought it was a little presumptuous to think that our opinion was the be all end all um, on these works. So we really want to encourage collaboration and start debates over the things that we've said. So the user um, forums are a really important part of the site. And our priorities in designing it were um, to make it easy to use and aesthetically pleasing, which might seem a bit superficial, but is actually really important when you're making a website because a lot of smart people have made a lot of really bad websites. Um, I think we can all say that if something just kind of doesn't look right or is a little bit complicated or hard to use, you're probably not going to use it. Like I'll probably try to figure out a website for about five minutes and then that's it. I'm moving on to something else if I don't get it by then. So this is really important things to consider. Um, we also want it to be interactive and compatible with portable devices because um, my colleague is actually researching poetry and if you pull it up on your iPhone and the lines are all broken and out of order, that's like a really big issue if you're trying to study the way a poem is structured. So we really wanted to make sure it's compatible with iPads, iPhones, the whole gamut. Um, and that is suitable for people with a variety of experience. So we wanted everyone from high school students to people with PhDs to be able to really understand how to use this site. So um, we kind of tried to customize it to an unspecific audience. Uh, and so my role in all of this was studying James Joyce's Ulysses and writing a series of annotations for that book. So really quickly, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on James Joyce. Um, he was baptized Catholic and had a Jesuit education. So he was kind of steeped in Latin and the classics from a very young age. His education basically refined this. Um, he performed really well in Latin, not so well in his other subjects, but um, you know, he got like monetary prizes for doing well on exams. So this is something that's been really you know, important for him throughout his whole life. 
Um, he also just has this fascination with language. Um, in a later book he wrote called Finnegan's Wake, he actually composed his own Latin in essentially almost his own language. It's kind of gibberish, pretty hard to read, but this shows a real interest in how language works, um, how people can use it to communicate their ideas. And he was also multilingual. He spoke French and Italian really well and dabbled in a bunch of other languages. Um, so he's clearly someone who's really interested in the classics, interested in language, literature. Um, and what he ended up doing was becoming a poet, playwright, and novelist that wrote with this really revolutionary kind of modernist style. So he had all these crazy devices. Um, the most famous is probably what I have here is called the internal monologue, but you've probably heard about it in school as the stream of consciousness. So where people just kind of say everything that comes to their mind. This is essentially what his writing style is like in a lot of his works. Um, he also uses a lot of puns, coins new words, has allusions all over the place, vivid imagery. So it's really dense and can be really hard to read, but it's also really rich material. Um, and maybe because of all these devices, one of his best friends described his work as inconceivable and absurd. So um, there's definitely some challenges that come along with reading him. Um, and a lot of his work is very controversial because of all these stylistic elements. Um, and he's definitely best known for his work Ulysses, which I'm studying, um, and which was published in 1922. So just to talk about this a little bit, Ulysses is basically considered a modern odyssey. Um, and the word Ulysses is actually the Latinized version of Odysseus, who was a Greek hero who fought in the Trojan War. Um, he's kind of a, known as like a trickster character. He's the guy who built the wooden horse. Um, and the whole story of the Odyssey is after he fought this war, he spends 10 years going through all these trials and tribulations before he can journey home. Um, and so Ulysses is based on the Odyssey, but it's set in Dublin, in Ireland, um, on June 16th, 1904. So obviously there's pretty big differences in plot, um, in characterization, in location. Um, for example, in the Odyssey, the whole kind of point at the end of it is that his wife has been waiting faithfully um, you know, for 20 years for him to come home and is still there. Uh, in Ulysses, the whole story is about how the main character's wife is having an affair. So there's clearly some differences in you know, the modern retelling of the story. Um, and it just narrates a day in the life of these two uh, men, Stephen Dedalus, who's kind of the younger version, often seen as you know, Joyce's um, kind of rep representation of himself. There are some differences, but they're pretty similar. Um, and then also Leopold Bloom, who's kind of this older character who represents Odysseus. And it was first published in a magazine, um, but it was censored because he had a lot of crude content that kind of offended people. Um, so he had some issues with publication, but eventually pushed it through as a book a few years later. And so to talk about the role of the classics in Ulysses, um, yeah, I was really big on the memes <laughs> when I was making this. Um, so you would think, oh, the classics, you know, their importance in Ulysses, this is pretty easy, right? Because the central comparison is really clear. Like it's called Ulysses. But things actually are not quite that simple, um, as you might have gathered from me talking about all of his crazy stylistic traits. Uh, and I have this quote here from Joyce that I think really describes his attitude towards um, his work. He says, I put in so many enigmas and puzzles that it will keep the professors busy, busy for centuries arguing over what I meant. And that's the way to ensure your immortality. So a little into himself, but basically he was completely aware that he was creating such a complex and rich work. And that's what he wanted to do, was to put in all these references that you know might not be apparent upon the first time you read something. Um, and so there's this whole issue of translation that kind of comes up in the title. Um, it's called Ulysses, but Ulysses is the Latin name for a Greek person. And it's kind of interesting because James Joyce knew Latin very well, but didn't really know Greek. So this kind of brings up these whole layers of translation, like maybe he read Latin versions of the Odyssey, not the original. Maybe he read English translations. So it just kind of shows that the relationship to the classical world is not really straightforward. Um, also, he had this complex scheme for building the book. So each chapter was named after a character in the Odyssey. Um, and so when he published you know, the chapter serially in a magazine one at a time, he had these titles. Like one chapter was called Nestor, one was called Proteus. Um, but then when he published as a book, he didn't want to make things too easy, right? So he got rid of all the chapter headings. So you're kind of left on your own to figure it out. So it's something that's not you know, necessarily immediately apparent or very black and white. Um, yeah. And he also suggested um, to his aunt, actually, he said everyone should read uh, you know, the Odyssey before you read Ulysses, which is something that probably not most people do. So um, to talk about my role in working with this um, novel, there's basically kind of two things I did. I worked with the computer stuff, and then I did kind of the literature, humanity stuff. So we started with this website, um, and we decided to build it on WordPress. So it's an independently hosted WordPress site. Um, and we customized it by learning basic coding, so some HTML and CSS, which isn't too fancy, but for a classics major, that was a lot. So it was really cool to um, you know, learn how to use a computer. And at times, it was very frustrating, hence the photo. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, this is the example of the header for the site. So you can search the information in a few different ways. You can search by the Irish author, by a classical author, by a major work, by theme. So we tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. 
Um, you can also search by categories or tags because everything's organized that way. Um, and the obstacles of putting these things online are essentially kind of adhering to copyright law. I was really lucky because Ulysses came out of copyright in 2012, but that's the original version. And Joyce liked to edit Ulysses without a copy of the original text on hand, so you just write paragraphs out from memory and then change them. So there's a standard edition that kind of makes sense of all his edits, and that is not yet out of copyright. So I kind of had you know balance how I can format the work to be you know understandable to people and accessible, but I can't really violate copyright. Um, also, just maintaining textual integrity, like I said before, with pages, lines, so on. Um, and so just to show you, this is how WordPress works kind of from the back end. You can edit it when it looks like this, kind of seeing what it'll appear like on screen. Or you can actually go in and look at the HTML. Um, and then when you're finished, it'll kind of let you preview it. And this is what the finished page would look like. Um, and so to talk about the annotations really quickly, um, essentially what I would do is read a chapter, identify all the classical references I could see, then read other people and see what they thought about it, and then try to take all this information and write a really concise and precise footnote. And right here is an example of what that would look like. Um, so as you can see the bold text right there, if you hovered your mouse over the word Cassandra, this little gloss would pop up and tell you, oh, this is who Cassandra was, this is what she did. Um, and it's challenging because you know you have everyone from people with not much experience to people really experienced in the classics reading it, so you had to kind of tailor it to just what is essential to know to understand the reference, just like the bare minimum. Because for me, I was like, oh wow, this is all really cool, but I had to remember that not everyone in the world loves the classics as much as I do. Um, and then basically we just use coding to insert the footnote into the text. Um, and so I think there's two main areas of impact um, for this kind of research. And the first is in studying kind of Joyce and studying his work. Because there's two main ways of understanding his kind of view of the classics um, and scholarship. And the first is that he's invoking the classics kind of satirically to show here are like our great classical ideals, you know, the standards they've been upheld for thousands of years, and here's modern society down here, and like how far have we fallen, and how these ideals are really just incompatible. Um, someone described kind of the classical ideal in modern society in Joyce as parallels that never meet. So that's one point of view, um, and I included a picture of another satire of Homer. Um, and then the other view, which I'm kind of more inclined to adhere to myself, is the idea that Joyce kind of uses a classical tradition in a really sincere way to understand the modern world. Um, so you have all these incidental kind of superficial differences, like maybe the characters act differently, maybe it's set somewhere else. But underneath this, there's this underlying thematic unity, for example, in the idea of like what it means to be a hero. Um, that I think really shows that it can be seen that Joyce is using the classics in a constructive way, not just kind of as a parody or satire. Um, I think the strongest proof for this is that kind of, as his biographer said, Joyce ventured to disagree with satirical readings. He was really um, unhappy that people didn't explore the Odyssean parallels more when they criticized his work because they focused on kind of his crazy stream of consciousness stuff. And he told people, like I said before, to read the Odyssey first to truly understand his work. Um, and the other area where you can see um, kind of the importance of this project is just a debate about the digital humanities. Um, when I started on the website, I was really excited, like, wow, this is the future, this is so great, and there's nothing bad about it. Um, but I came to realize, you know, to look at something realistically, you have to realize there's pros and cons. Um, and one of the cons is that you have to kind of constantly maintain the site and always have people working on it. Because right now, our WordPress platform is great, but what if WordPress gets updated and you know I'm not working on the project anymore, and then the site kind of goes out of use or is broken, links don't work, things like that. So it's really kind of a downside that you have to have someone constantly maintaining it. And it's hard to have this kind of lifelong project when people you know, come in and out of things, you know, their scholarly interests change. Um, and there's also this question of how people feel about quantifying a discipline that's traditionally subjective. Um, I have a really great quote from a New York Times article where someone says, um, the humanities, after all, deal with elusive questions of aesthetics, existence, and meaning. The words that bring tears or the melody that raises goosebumps are these elements that can be measured, which is an important thing to think about. Um, so I think that's why on our website we try to put out our analysis with a really encouraged discussion. So it's not just you know one-sided black or white view. Um, and as I've kind of talked about the whole time, there's obviously many pros this kind of research too to end on a more positive note. It makes ideas and scholarship a lot more accessible so it can foster discussion among experts who might never actually meet in real life. Um, it allows even more of a public discourse. As I've said, we're hoping that um, a lot of people will use this even if they're kind of new to the fields of Joyce and scholarship and the classics. Um, and it provides new ways of analyzing works. Um, so it's a really great thing. Uh, and I think just to kind of leave on this note, um, for me, the coolest thing about this project has been taking something um, that a lot of people see as obscure or like inaccessible as the classics and kind of really showing that something that everyone can understand and use. Um, and this is a quote by Thoreau that I really like um, because it says that the classics are oracles that are providing answers to even the most modern of our questions. And I think that that's really true and I hope that our website will continue to do that and help people to explore the classics and see how it's still relevant to people like Joyce and even the rest of us today. Thank you.